Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2018 Premier Auction. And today we're taking a look at a gun that I've actually done some video on before, a long time ago. This is the Smith & Wesson model of 1940 light rifle, or so it was designated by the uh, British government. And the reason we're taking a look at them again today is because now I actually have two examples, one of the Mark I and one of the Mark II. So we can actually compare and show you what changed between the two. So this was originally designed in 1939 by a Smith & Wesson engineer by the name of Edward Pomeroy, and this was actually tested by Aberdeen Proving Grounds for the U.S. military. Smith & Wesson wanted a U.S. military contract for these at first. And Aberdeen tested this gun and basically came back saying, eh, also it's not full auto and it's not 45, so you know, maybe try us again when it's full auto and it's chambered for 45. These are, in fact, open bolt, semi-automatic uh, carbines chambered for 9mm parabellum. So uh, Smith & Wesson, I'm not sure if they ever actually tried converting one to 45 or building one in 45. What they ended up doing instead was uh, looking across the ocean and realizing, hey, you know, the United Kingdom really needs guns, like, a lot, because they're thinking they might actually get invaded by Nazi Germany. So maybe we can just sell these to the British, which the British were, uh, were quite willing to take them up on. So they, they came up with a contract uh, with Great Britain and started manufacturing guns and shipped them over, and then there was a problem. Uh, the British, doing their due diligence, put some of these guns through some basic field trials, including an endurance test. And they wanted to run 5,000 rounds through one of these guns in 9mm. That shouldn't be a big deal, right? Well, the problem is the 9mm loading that Smith & Wesson had used to design the gun and the 9mm loading that the British were using to test it were not the same. The British load had two grains more powder, which may not sound like a lot, but in a pistol caliber case, that's really a substantial increase in powder and these guns couldn't survive a 5,000 round endurance test with British ammunition. The threaded rear section of the receiver cap would snap off, and that's obviously a problem. So uh, Smith & Wesson got a bit upset at, uh, or the British got a bit upset at Smith & Wesson. Uh, they rejected the guns. They wanted their million dollar, million pound deposit back. Smith & Wesson had already spent that money tooling up to make these and didn't have it. This was a big problem for Smith & Wesson at the time, and ultimately it was solved by offering the British uh, revolvers, Smith & Wesson revolvers for the 38-200 cartridge in lieu of their, the return of their advance payment on these rifles. And the British accepted that because they needed revolvers as well. So that kind of saved Smith & Wesson's bacon in this uh, situation. Now there are two different versions that were made. Most of these are a Mark I pattern, which is this guy. However, uh, before they even stopped shipping the guns to the UK, Smith & Wesson had made some improvements, and they'd come up with a Mark II pattern. So since we have examples of each, let's go ahead and take a look at them side by side and pull them apart and see how they're similar and how they're different. Alright, so the easiest way to distinguish between a Mark I and a Mark II is that the Mark II has this corrugated uh, sleeve on the middle of the receiver, and that acts as a safety. Uh, we will take a closer look at that in just a minute, but because that's really the the only seriously visually distinguishable difference, uh, we'll leave it at that for a moment and concentrate on the Mark I. So controls on this are very simple. Uh, there is no selector switch because this is semi-auto only. So you've got a trigger and you've got a safety. Bolt handle is up here, angled out the top right side of the gun. And these are open bolt guns, so you have to cock the bolt handle back at first. Then you can fire it. It'll slam forward fire a cartridge, and then recoil will open it back up. This is a simple blowback action. Now, now once the bolt is back, we can use the safety lever, and what that does is just lock the bolt in place. So if I pull the trigger, nothing happens, because this is holding it in place. Uh, that's it. It's pretty simple. The sights are actually a lot better than I would have expected. Um, they have a big open square notch and a really big squared off front sight post to go with it. However, the kind of goofy thing is, if you look really closely here, we actually have uh, range measurements. Oh, you can barely read those things. There's a little notch right here at the midpoint of the sight, and you can line up these little horizontal lines, and they start at 200, and they go out to 400 yards right there. Um, 
that's kind of ludicrous for this rifle. But I don't know which is goofier, the idea that you could shoot that far effectively with this, or the idea that you could actually read those sight markings. But that's the rear sight. And there's the front sight, just for reference sake. Now there are a couple goofy features of this thing, and number one is the barrel. So this is actually a removable barrel. Uh, there's a little locking tab here, you can pull back, and then you could put a, uh, a wrench on this, uh, this knurled section here and unscrew the barrel. However, what's goofy about this is that they fluted the barrel. They gave it a really heavy barrel and then fluted it, as if you would really have a lot of need for the extra cooling surface on the barrel from flutes for a semi-automatic 9mm carbine with a 20 round magazine. Uh, not only is that a little bit unrealistic, I think, but it's also a really expensive barrel to make. Uh, imagine that you could just machine this flat. And in fact you could also make it smaller diameter if you wanted the gun lighter, because this thing is over 9 pounds empty and over 10 pounds loaded, which is really pretty excessive for a semi-auto 9mm carbine. And because of this heavy barrel it's really weighted uh, balanced forward, which is not particularly comfortable. At any rate, uh, this is part of what made this gun really expensive. Uh, that, that's an expensive barrel to make. The next goofy thing about this is this big tower. Uh, the magazine actually sits here, going into the front of this tower, like that. It's a, well it's actually kind of a nose-in, rock-back uh, pistol caliber magazine. Notice they've curved the bottom of the mag so it slides in there. It's held in place by this little latch at the bottom. It's a 20 round double stack double feed mag. The magazine design is just fine. What's weird is this tower, because the magazine sits in the front section of this tower, and the rear section here is actually the ejection port. So this ejects downward out the bottom of the receiver, and then the cartridges kind of tinkle down through this tower and fall out the bottom. And I expect the idea here was that brass won't go flying around, you can have a bunch of people shooting side by side, and you won't interfere with anyone else. Which is fine and all, except that if you should have some sort of malfunction, normally all you have to do is like open the bolt, stick your finger in the, the ejection port, pull out whatever kind of stuck case you've got, and away you go. Well with this thing, you have no actual physical access, because it, you can't, it doesn't work. Um, so if just cycling the bolt back and forth doesn't fix your problem, then you actually have to completely field strip the gun, uh, or if you have a cartridge sort of stuck up in here, you have to use a cleaning rod down the barrel to knock it out. This is fine, like for a competition gun in a nice clean, you know, target range. This is not really so much of a military thing, uh, especially when you consider some of the other situations in which it might be used, like for example in maybe muddy ground. Uh, if you go prone with this thing in the mud, you stand a good chance of plugging this whole thing up with mud in the process. And then it'll work for a little while, but eventually you're going to fill this thing up once you've fired a magazine or two, and then you're going to have to unplug this to get the empty brass out before the gun will work again. There's, there's real problems with this tower idea. We should take a moment here to take a look at the markings. Uh, we do have a Smith & Wesson trademark little logo there on the back of the receiver. Smith & Wesson, Springfield, Massachusetts, right on the side of the receiver. On the opposite side of the receiver are the two relevant patent numbers. And then the only other thing on there is the serial number, which is on the bottom tang just behind the pistol grip. This is number 657, and it is marked Mark I. Now what they made for the British uh, was about 800 Mark I's and about 200 Mark II's. What's interesting here though is they made a lot more, they made about twice as many receivers as they actually delivered complete guns. So the serial numbers uh, will range around, and they'll, they'll get higher than the 1227 uh, guns that were actually completed. Because some of these, presumably in particular some of the ones that were left over at Smith & Wesson, were manufactured on, uh, you know, they were, when, once the contract was cancelled they took what parts they had and assembled guns. And some of those were assembled on, on receivers that were out of uh, out of serial number order. In fact, if we look at our Mark II example, it is number uh, 1523. So in fact higher than the total number of guns produced. Also note that it doesn't have a Mark II marking, they just left it empty. Now speaking of the Mark II, there were a couple, issue, couple things that they changed. They added this sleeve, and uh, reading the literature you will often 
uh, read that this sleeve was actually there to reinforce the receiver so that it, it wouldn't break the way they had in British trials, where, I mean, not only did they not make the 5,000 round endurance test, on some of the guns the receiver sheared off, the, the end of the receiver sheared off with as few as 1,000 rounds fired. Well, this is actually not a strengthening part. This actually weakens the receiver. I'll show you that in just a moment. But the reason that it's here is to act as a rotary safety. So on this one, you'll notice the receiver is still cut for this uh, lever safety, but the piece isn't there. And instead what you do is, well, you can either lock it this way, which prevents the bolt from coming back, which will prevent it uh, from picking up a cartridge and firing if you drop it on its uh, stock. Or if you cock the thing, you can then lock the sleeve around, and now this sleeve holds the bolt back. You don't need to have a safety mechanism on the trigger, because if the bolt won't go forward, that, that's the whole point of the safety. So mission accomplished there. So that's what this sleeve is there to do. Internally they made a couple other changes. So let's pull these apart, uh, and I'll show you what the internal changes are as well. This assembly here is a little bit goofy. Uh, you want to make sure the bolt's forward so that the main spring is relaxed. Done. Then you go to this. This is nothing more than a screw that uh, limits the forward travel of the trigger. And you have to have the trigger farther forward than this allows in order to have the receiver come apart and the bolt come off over the sear. So what you do, and this is really kind of a weird hack of a design, we have a little detent spring right here. You're going to push that in, and then you're going to unscrew this as far as you can. Now if you unscrew this all the way, it just comes out. So Smith & Wesson's solution here was to put in this little guy, which basically limits how far you can remove the screw. If you don't push it down, you can't unthread the thing at all. And once you do push it down, you can only unscrew it that far. So we've got it that far. Now we are going to push out this cross pin, right there. This is a captive pin, you can see the little detent recess right here, so that will stay nicely in place. And then you're going to hold the trigger forward and slide the receiver, well, the stock assembly frame, off of the receiver. Next up we have to unscrew the end of the actual receiver tube, what you saw before. Over here is just a cover. This is locked in place by this little spring-loaded extension of this dust cover. That serves to close off the open slot in the receiver, uh, just this little section of it when the bolt handles forward. So we're going to push this in, unscrew the end cap here. Note that this end cap has this hole uh, built into it that hole lines up with this cross pin. So when you've got this end cap on, what it's actually locking into is this threaded cap on the inside of the receiver. So this comes out, that's got our guide rod mainspring on it. We can then pull out the dust cover here. It's just a simple two pieces with a little spring in it. So goes in there. This thing rides in a pair of grooves that are cut in the receiver tube, another expensive proposition. And now we can pull out the bolt. Here it's snapping over the sear, and there's our bolt. Now before we go into the Mark II and the internal differences, I want to show you how this actually fires, because that's identical for both of them. So we have a sear right here on the bottom of the bolt. And that locks into this slot in the receiver. So when this thing is in battery, you can see right there, that sear snaps up and locks on this piece. And they have cut a relief in the tube, because this is probably not, not really a, a hardened or otherwise heat treated receiver, but they do have a little hardened strip, because every time you fire this sear is going to be slamming into this uh, edge of the receiver right there. So they put in sort of a little band-aid shaped uh, hardened steel part. Notice that it is serialized to the gun, and that's what takes the impact of the sear. So uh, the, the bolt sits like this, and in order to fire you have to just depress that sear, and then under spring pressure the bolt will go forward and fire. 
when it comes back, of course, it snaps up right there. We've got our trigger that just pivots right here. Uh, it doesn't have any spring. Any springiness in the trigger is actually the sear spring acting on it. The trigger has a big round peg right there that, when you pull the trigger, just pushes the sear up, which lifts it over the, uh, the locking surface and allows it to fire. There's also that little finger on the left, right there, that is the semi-auto disconnector. So as long as you have the trigger pulled, uh, when the bolt comes back, that little finger is going to snap past this spring-loaded detent, and then this will hit that finger and lock in front of it, and it will hold the bolt back until you release the trigger, at which point this will drop down and engage in the receiver. So that's how, it, how the semi-auto functionality works. We have the Mark I bolt on top and the Mark II bolt on the bottom. So you will notice that they actually made the Mark II bolt just a little bit shorter. Kind of curious, not entirely sure why they did that. Uh, more to our point, the Mark II has a firing pin fixed on the face of the bolt, on the bolt face. The Mark I does not. So the Mark I gun actually has a floating firing pin and it has this lever in it, and if I pull this lever back, the firing pin comes forward. Do that with a punch, it'll work better. There's the gun actually firing. And what happens when, when this is in the gun, there's a little stud on the inside of the receiver right at uh, the end of travel of the bolt. The bolt flies forward, it picks up a cartridge here, loads it into the chamber, and as soon as it's fully seated, that stud on the inside hits that lever which causes the firing pin to cam forward, and it fires the gun. Um, this is a nice, complicated, and expensive way to manufacture an open bolt submachine gun, compared to just milling a fixed firing pin onto the bolt face. Uh, this, is, this change from floating to fixed is exactly the same as the Italians did on the Beretta Model 38 guns. So the pre-war guns have a floating pin, just like Smith & Wesson's, and the, uh, the later wartime models have a fixed firing pin. I said I'd show you this. The literature all says that uh, Smith & Wesson on the Mark II strengthened the receiver so that it wouldn't snap off after a thousand or a couple thousand rounds. And most people will say that this sleeve is the strengthening part. Well, if you look at this closely, you'll realize that this basic receiver tube is exactly the same on both guns. Um, they're the same diameter back here, they're the same diameter up here. You can see this uh, little ledge right there is the same on both guns. And if we tilt this over and look at... If we look at these surfaces right here, you'll see that they actually milled material away to allow this uh, rotary safety to fit on the receiver. So the Mark II receiver is actually thinner than the Mark I. Now, I don't think that's a big deal, because I don't think this is where the receiver would have had problems. I think the receiver would have had problems back here. However, our two end caps are exactly the same. These thread diameters are exactly the same. In fact, I can take the Mark II rear end cap, and I can thread it right onto the Mark I receiver. It fits just fine. And the receiver end covers, the, the rear caps, are also exactly the same size. They're the same diameter. Uh, they, they didn't strengthen or otherwise change these, aside from removing the safety lever on the Mark II. So while this rotary safety sleeve makes the gun look stronger, it makes the thing look bigger in diameter, it's an optical illusion. In reality, the receiver here is actually smaller than the Mark I receiver. So I'm comfortable saying Smith & Wesson actually didn't do anything to strengthen these guns. They made a few changes, uh, probably on request. This safety is better than this one, I would suspect. This, the original safety doesn't do anything to prevent the, the gun from firing unintentionally if it's dropped on the stock. And, and the simplification to the bolt makes sense just from a, a cost perspective. But Smith & Wesson never actually solved the, the big problem with these guns, which was the durability of the receiver. In fact, I should point out, you may have noticed that there's this discoloration on the side of the Mark I stock. The reason for that is when Smith & Wesson sold these things, they affixed warning labels to them. Uh, extremely dangerous, do not load or fire. And this was originally glued on here with some sort of glue that has uh, 
come loose over the, the many years, and it has fallen off now, but um, Smith & Wesson considered these uh, a great liability risk. And when they were, in order to be willing to sell them to a distributor, uh, they had to affix these giant warning labels. One last bit, where, while we're talking about the durability, I want to point out why this durability was such an issue here. Um, first off, that's our recoil spring. It's not a particularly strong recoil spring. The bolts, it's got some mass to it, but it's not, well, it's obviously not as heavy and massive of a bolt as it should be. And then we have what's probably the bigger issue. If I put this bolt into the gun, this, the sear has just engaged, so this is the position that the bolt is coming back to every single time you fire. And there's our rear end cap, which is going to sit, thread it all the way in, right there. What you're seeing here is that this bolt has, for all the length of the receiver, it has very little travel to actually fully decelerate. So what's happening is every time you fire, the end of the bolt is smacking right into this threaded end cap. And eventually that is going to cause this to fail at its narrowest point. And its narrowest point is going to be in one of the valleys. It's going to be like right through one of these threaded cuts. Um, that's the weakest part of the gun, that's where it's going to fail. And note that it's this hole right here that is actually physically connected to the rear half of the receiver. So that's being held in place by this. If this threading snaps off, it's going to, this, this piece is going to be free floating on the back with this little threaded bit. It's going to be inside this, and it will appear that the gun will have broken in half right here, because this whole thing is just going to slide right off the back of the receiver. Uh, the actual break will be here, but from the outside it's going to look like this is the piece that broke. I suspect that has also contributed to why people think that this uh, had a job to reinforce the receiver, because it kind of looks like this is where the breaking point would be, but not in actuality. So in total, 1,227 of these were made, and uh, 1,010 of them were actually shipped to England, or to the UK, uh, before the whole kerfuffle came down and, and it all fell apart. Uh, after World War II, the British destroyed almost all of them. I think there are five left in various British museums and reference collections, military reference collections. The rest, along with a lot of other war surplus, this was kind of a standard thing for them at the time, they just dumped it in the ocean. You know what, what are they going to do with these things? Just gone. So that was it for the Smith & Wesson light rifles until 1974, when someone at Smith & Wesson was like cleaning out the basement, and they found some crates. And what did these crates hold? Well, what do you know? A couple hundred 1940 light rifles. Literally in 1974 they found in the basement of Smith & Wesson 137 Mark 1s, Mark 1s, and 80 Mark II's just sitting down there. And uh, one, there was a distributor in the area, a guy named Bill Orr, who ran GT Distributors, and he's, he was basically like, hey, I'll buy those from you. And so he negotiated and arranged and bought the entire batch from Smith & Wesson uh, in 1975, and then he resold them commercially re on retail. Uh, and over the course of about a year uh, they were all sold off. So instead of there just being five left in British collections, there are now 200 and a few uh, floating around in on the commercial market. So these are actually to some extent available. Uh, certainly these two are available because Rock Island is selling them in September. Uh, but it's it's pretty cool, even though, I mean, this is a really good example of Smith & Wesson making a beautiful product that was totally not what anybody wanted. Uh, it's not, not so good to make a rifle that can't actually survive the basic endurance test. So uh, they are a, a very cool piece of esoteric trivia from World War II. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, it was really cool to be able to take apart both patterns side by side. I think we learned some things that I hadn't realized before. Thanks for watching.